In this video, I'm going to go over Aragorn's lineage and explain how he is the King of Gondor. Now, in this point in the Lord of the Rings, he hasn't been coronated, so he's not acting as king, but rightfully he's like the king-in-waiting. Um, he is the rightful heir to the throne of Gondor. And what I'm going to go over, I hope will help you understand Scraff's article, even Reeves' video, and help you uh, with your post for this week in the discussion forum on kingship. So let's start by going over Aragorn's family tree a little bit, okay? If we go back into his lineage, uh, we will see Arendel. So remember, Arendel is the half-man, half-elf who took one of the Simerals, or really the Simeral that Baron got from Morgoth's hand. He took that Simeral to the Undying Lands, uh, like where the elves were. All right. Arendel comes from three houses of men that together were called the Edain. Okay, that's sometimes a term that's used to apply to Aragorn, and that's why it's referring to his lineage all the way back to Arendel. Now, Arendel had two sons, Elrond and Elros. We met Elrond at the Council of Elrond, where um, the Fellowship decided to take the ring and destroy it. Okay, Elrond and Elros fought against Morgoth, who was like Saruma, or Sauron's boss, and they were rewarded with the island of Numenor, okay? It was kind of like the Garden of Eden, but with mortality, meaning the people who lived in Numenor would die. All right, now, after Morgoth's fall, the Valar made Elrond and Elros choose whether they wanted to belong to elves or men. So remember, Arendel was a half-elf and half-man. Now, Elrond decided to uh, choose his fate with the elves and be immortal, Elros chose with the men and got mortality. However, the Valar ended up gifting Elros um, and his descendants with extra long life. So this is why Aragorn um, is quite old um, for a man. All right, so from Elros, we get Elendil, who um, also fought against um, Morgoth and Sauron. And then from Elendil, we get Isildur, all right? Isildur is the one who cut the ring from Sauron's hand, all right? So this is why Aragorn's often referring to Isildur. Um, the sword um, Anduril, which Aragorn carries, was Isildur's sword. All right, now to give a little more context, which will come up this week, um, Elendil had two sons, Isildur and Anarion. Anarion is actually... Um, kind of a forefather of Boromir, all right? So they're kind of related, Aragorn and Boromir, and this maybe explains some of the tension between Boromir and, uh, and Aragorn. All right, now Boromir's father is Denethor, who you will encounter this week, and Denethor is descended from Anarion, who is one of Elendil's other sons, okay? And you're also going to encounter another character this week called Faramir, who is Boromir's brother. So in a way, these three men are kind of contenders in a way for the throne of Gondor, okay? And that's not really clear immediately in the books, but it does explain a little bit while Boromir recognizes his kinship to Aragorn and sort of sees hope in him. Um, but maybe at least in the movie, we do get the sense that there's almost a little bit of competitiveness. That's maybe not quite in the books, but I kind of think the movie does a good job of maybe adding that in a little bit. All right, so to explain a little bit more about Numenor, which was the island that the Valar gave to um, Elros' descendants, um, it is basically located in between the two continents. So remember this map from Reeves' video, we have Middle Earth here on the left and the Undying Lands on the right. Numenor is an island right in the middle. It's kind of the Atlantis myth in Tolkien's mythology. It eventually falls into the sea and is drowned. And I'm gonna explain why that happens. All right, so the Edain, the men, eventually sailed out as explorers from Numenor over to Middle-earth and kind of subjugated it, all right? So we can see here's Gondor, here's the Shire. They subjugated all of this land, all right? So they grew in their sea abilities, and we find that the more joy was their life, the more they began to long for the immortality of the elves. So they got a little jealous of the elves. All right, this created a divide among the Numenorians, among um, basically the Edain. The kings and their followers started to rebel against the Valar, who were the angels, who had rewarded them and given them this island for their faithfulness. But the faithful to the Valar stayed true. Um, okay, and basically what was causing the conflict is the men wanted to become immortal, but the, it wasn't in the Valar's power to make men immortal because it went against Iluvatar's original design that men would be mortal and elves would be immortal. 
All right, so now as we get a bunch of kings, you have to kind of think of the Old Testament Israel and their kings. There were good kings and there were bad kings. When they had good kings, things went well. When they had bad kings, things didn't go so well. Now, the Numenorians eventually kind of grew in pride, right? Their kings and their followers little by little abandoned the use of the Eldaran tongues. And at last, the 20th king took his royal name in Numenorian form, calling himself Ar Adonakar, meaning Lord of the West. And this seemed ill omen to the faithful, for hitherto they have given that title only to one of the Valar. Okay, Lord of the West, I believe, was Manwe. So basically, this king is saying, I'm taking on the name of one of uh, these angels, or we would say one of these gods. So it's just a very prideful act. All right, eventually we get to King Tar Palantir. All right, he tried to change the course of Numenor like a good king and get it back on track and start respecting the Valar again. But the following king, again, this is just like Israel, have a good king followed by a bad king. Good king, bad king. All right, this bad king, King Ar-Pharazan, sailed out to Middle-earth to challenge Sauron, who was kind of ruling there in Middle-earth, um, challenge Sauron basically for the supremacy of Middle-earth. All right, he wanted to rule all of Middle-earth, all right, which was that uh, eastern continent. All right, so the defeat of Sauron. So King Ar-Pharazan Ar captures Sauron, and brought him back to Numenor, where Sauron eventually earned the king's trust and became an advisor. Okay, Sauron then seduces King ar with a lie. It's kind of like the same lie that's in the Garden of Eden. We almost see the same thing with how Wormtongue was sort of seducing Theoden, and Saruman tries to seduce um, Theoden a bit. It's kind of that same thing. So what we learn is that Sauron lied to the king, declaring that everlasting life would be his who possessed the undying lands, and that the ban um, for immortal life that was imposed on Numenor to prevent the kings of men from surpassing the Valar. So basically the Valar said, hey men, you're not allowed into the undying lands, this is a big no-no. All right, and what happened was Sauron basically said, oh, if you go over to the undying lands and conquer it, um, you can almost get like immortal life. All right, so that was sort of the lie. Again, it sounds a little bit like the Garden um, of Eden. So King Arpharazan sailed to the Undying Lands, and the Valor called on Iluvatar to save them. They're saying, hey, the, these men are breaking the rules. So Iluvatar responded by sinking the island of Numenor and removing the Undying Lands forever from the circles of the world. So I think that's kind of where a lot of people start to feel like the Undying Lands is heaven, even though it's not technically heaven. All right, so there you can see a little bit of reference to kind of like the fall in the Garden of Eden and also the Atlantis myth. All right, so what happens from there? Well, not all the Numenorians died in the sinking of Numenor. Elendil escaped the destruction of Numenor with some of his followers. These were the faithful to the Valar. And they basically went and founded the realms of Gondor and um, Arnor. And you can see their whole kingdom here as it was at the time. So Elendil had two sons, Isildur and Anarion. All right, Isildur ruled Arnon, which would be like the northern kingdom. Kind of think of Israel again. And Anarion ruled Gondor, which is the southern kingdom. All right, so some interesting facts about both kingdoms. So Arnor was in the north, and it was kind of divided into three different kingdoms, um, which are circled here, okay? And what happened is these kingdoms would sometimes fight each other. They didn't always get along, and one of those major conflicts was over Weathertop. So if you remember, that's where Frodo uh, escaped after Bree, and that's where he was stabbed by uh, the Nazgul, okay, the Black Riders. All right, so some of the Dane kings are buried in the Barrow Downs. That's where the Barrows took Frodo and his friends and where they end up getting their swords, okay? The Shire is also located within one of these three kingdoms, all right, of Arnor. Gondor in the south remained unified, um, unified, it never divided, but the line of kings became mingled with northern blood with this country up here, uh, kind of in the north. Think of it like this, when Israel was marrying those outside of the faith, when they were marrying Canaanite women and everything, their blood became mingled. All right, so because of this, no one held unchallenged claim to the throne, meaning the line of descent uh, was no longer clear, and what eventually happened was the last clear king to take control of Gondor basically appointed his steward in place to be ruler, and then the line of steward became hereditary, and Gondor ended up being ruled by stewards instead of, per se, the king, okay? So the steward of Gondor is Denethor, okay? Denethor basically became, like, king, and so, in a way, Boromir was next to be king. So when Boromir's meeting Aragorn, he's immediately recognizing, oh, 
Technically, Aragorn's the rightful king of Gondor, but that means I won't be king when my father dies. Okay, so there is some tension there. Now, a little interesting fact about the northern kingdom, Arnor, is that there was a kingdom called Agmar, which was created by the Nazgul king, all right, to attack Arnor. Now, we don't know the name of the witch king of Agmar, but he's often given that title. He's the head Nazgul in the book, so just a little fun trivia there. Now, just a couple things I want to say about the swords, because they tie in. Basically, Sting, Frodo's sword, was created in Beleriand, which is where Baron and Luthier, Luthien are from, from the Silmarillion, and Sting was made by elves, okay? Now, the Burrow swords, kind of in the Shire, or just outside the Shire in a ways, past Bree and stuff, these swords were created by the Dúnedain, right? So, Aragorn's ancestors, to fight the Witch King of Agmar specifically, okay? So that's why they have special power, and then when we get to the death of the Witch King, um, where, um, I won't try to spoil that for you, but you'll understand then why that sword is sort of significant. All right, so that's just a, an overview of the history of kings and Aragorn um, in Middle-earth. Hopefully that helps you out with your form post for this week.